boots on. <laughs> you forgot you gotta sit in a little place, huh? All right, so we're going to take a look this morning at just one verse of Megillah Sefer. We'll try to understand it and a little bit of the first level of Pshat, the level of Drush, we'll learn a little Medrash, and then we'll see what it means, Api Chsidus. The third Pasuk, the third verse of Megillah's Echa. The third Pasuk of the first chapter. In general, Megillah Seicha, for the most part, follows the Aleph Beis, letters of the Aleph Beis. So Aleph Beis, now we're up to Gimel. <coughs> Yom Yom says, Golsa Yehuda Me'oni. Yehuda went into exile out of poverty or affliction. Lemotza Manoyach out of great toil. She sits amongst the nations and she can't find any peace. All those who pursued her were able to reach her. So the notion of Yehuda doesn't say Golsa Yisrael, doesn't say Israel went into Gol, says Yehuda went into Gol. The Geneza suggests that Yehuda could refer both to men and women. It's a uh, works either way, whereas Yisrael is more of a masculine terminology. And Yirmiyahu Navi says, Golsa Yehuda, that Yehuda's Golas was Me'oini. What does this mean, Me'oini? So he says, the intention, the meaning, says the Mamlayas is, that before the Churban Beis Migdash, there were many people who exiled themselves. They self-exiled. They left Eretz Yisrael. And they gave themselves over into the hands of the enemy. Now why would people do that? Why would people leave their homes? Why would people leave their communities? Why would they leave their, their comfort zone and go to, to a strange place? So obviously they have to be forced into it. If they're doing it by their own volition, something must have forced them. What could have forced them? So Yermiola says, Golsa Yehuda, Yehuda exiled herself, Me'oini out of poverty. They called it, because there was raw, because there was starvation, so people became desperate. And in desperation, they thought that maybe things would be better elsewhere, that somehow they'd survive. So in a quest to survive, they self-exiled. What does it mean, Nomirei Vaveda? What does it mean out of great toil, out of great effort? So Rei Vaveda, Aveda usually means work. Sometimes work could be satisfying. Sometimes work could be onerous and backbreaking. But here, it's an overarching term for tzaris, for difficulties, and for sorrowful events that took place in the city. So the municipality where the Jewish people were, say Yerushalayim, was under such intense pressure in so many ways, and so many bad things were happening, that people just wanted to be away from Yerushalayim, and therefore they self-exiled. Another way of understanding this is, Golsa Yehudu Me'oini, is, this, is also with this emphasis of self-exile or us being the cause of our own problems. So me'oini seems to indicate out of our own poverty, out of our own desperation. And therefore another way of understanding this is that here we allude to the fact that we didn't, Yehuda did not listen to koil ha Yehuda did not listen to the voice of rebuke of Yirmiyo, both of Yirmiyo Hanavi and as well as Yecheskel Hanavi, Shenibu Aleha, that they all said prophecy, that we would go into Golos, Yehuda would go into Golos in the same way that Aseris HaShvatim went in. So Aseris HaShvatim, we're talking about something that they didn't see. There was no actual example of it. People say you have to learn from history. There was no Golos before. The real concept of the Golos, the real Golos last time was with Zion. It was a thousand years earlier. Nobody could relate to what happened a thousand years ago. Once upon a time, Jewish people were in Gullahs. And even then, they weren't exiled. There was no nation. A nation had never gotten into exile. It was a family that was displaced. And they went into Mitzrayim in great honor. It wasn't a Gullahs thing, per se. But now that Aser HaShvatim, which was the majority, almost 80% of the Jewish people, had been exiled and sent away, and their lands were desolate, so we had already, unfortunately, a very, very prominent precedent 
we can see this is the real deal. We saw a nation, a nation of Jewish people who were exiled. So really, there's no excuse we should have learned, we could have learned, we could have understood that if the Nevi'im say that just as they went into Golis, you would go into Golis, that we should have understood that this was going to happen. And this Golos was far more difficult than the Golos of Aseris Hashvatim. And the reason is that when Aseris Hashvatim went into Golos, they were not scattered. They went as a nation, they came in unison, and they were, as the Ma'am Loyas calls it, Am Levadad Yishken. The nation of Israel went, maybe in several groups, but the groups that they went in were very, very large and populous, and they lived together. Loike and Yehuda. But this is not the kind of Golos that Yehuda experienced. Shenispazra ben Agoyim, that we were scattered throughout all the nations. And this is the meaning of he, Yoshva Bagoyim. She settled amongst the nations, but did not find any peace or any respite. Why is this? Because between narrow straits, all of those who pursued her reached him. And here, the Ma'amloy suggests that this is the mashal the, that the Gemara talks about the Rabbi Shua, that we were like a small sheep that was mukefa ze'evim, that was surrounded by hungry wolves on all sides. And furthermore, this speaks not only of the past, not only of the Golos of yesteryear, not only of Yehuda who went into Golos, but this also presages the Goliath Yisrael b'meshech ha'deris the Golos of the Jewish people in the future generations. That as long as Kozman Shahayu Yechelim Lisar Lahalais Misim Lishilten, as long as there was people who were wealthy and Jewish people had a contribution to make, so they were able to allow them to remain amongst them. They had something from the Jews. They were getting money out of them. They were getting a tax out of them. But when financial success eluded them and they became impoverished, then Oz Higlaisam. And then the meaning is like this. Golso Yehudi, Yehuda goes into Golos, me'oini, when we're impoverished, when we can't pay the jizya, when we can't pay the taxes, when we can't pay the money they demand of us. So they have no reason to countenance us. They have no reason to be nice to us. And as such, they turf us out. The truth is that as we saw yesterday in a letter they ever wrote to Menachem Begin in the 60s, they ever told him that the, sometimes we, we end up in trouble with anti-Semitism because we have too much money, because people are jealous of the Jewish people, jealous of their success. And they say the Jewish people took all our money or whatever else it is that has been historically over the ages. And other times the anti-Semitism is rooted in the fact that Jewish people are impoverished and they're a burden on society and they're all they're doing is taking. And the truth is that anti-Semitism doesn't come from either. It doesn't come because we're wealthy. It doesn't come because we're impoverished. Anti-Semitism is a tragic reality. And in the end, most of the time, as long as we could still pay our way, as long as there was still some value in having us, so then they would allow us to remain. But the moment there was no value in it, so they, therefore they, they would send us into Golos, we would go into the next exile. And that's the idea of Golsa Yehudim Mi'oini. Mi'oini means out of poverty or because there was a <coughs> lack of funding or money. So this is a little bit of pshat as it's articulated or redacted by the the Imam Leis. And now I want to learn some actual medrash with you. Which the medrash is not necessarily the simple pshat, but it's more of a homiletic interpretation. So the medrash Shabbat says like this. Golsa Yehuda. It says that Yehuda went into Golos. So the obvious question is, who exactly is the subject of Megillah Seicha? The Phoenicians? The Greeks? The Assyrians? The Babylonians? The Akkadians? Who, who is the subject of this Megillah? It was written in Hebrew by a Jewish prophet about an event that will happen to the people of Yehuda, which is the southern kingdom, primarily the tribes of Yehuda and Binyamin, although there was a smattering of other tribes that had joined them, and all of the 12 tribes are represented amongst the Jewish people. Some make the mistake of thinking that since the Aseris HaShvatim went into Golos, that there are no members of any other tribes amongst us, but it's factually incorrect. It's incorrect because the Pasuk, the verse indicates that during the time of Chizkiyahu HaMelech, refugees came and, and, and the scribes of Chizkiyahu expanded the city of Yerushalayim, including developing the Silwan and the, the, as a source of water. And it's actually found, archaeologically, they found it a few years ago. We thought there was a little muddy pool with the, where Arab kids play when you come out of the tunnel. And all of a sudden they found out there was like twice the size of an Olympic pool. 
they found the actual footings of it, they found the actual uh, the framing. So this is history in like vivid color. We know that Chizkiyo welcomed refugees. Who are these refugees? Obviously Jewish people that were coming from the north. And there's a Mishnah that speaks about the fact that Chulda Hanavia was absent. And the Mishnah asks, why was Chulda Hanavia not present? Why wasn't she doing what she was supposed to do? And, and the Mishnah answers because she was busy. She was away bringing home Aser Sashvatim. Now we know that Aser Sashvatim did not come home in mass. And what exactly it means today, nobody knows. Now, if, it, if it's a miraculous reality, still living in Atlantis, okay, fine, so that it's a miraculous reality. If it's a physical reality where there's uh, 50 million Jews somewhere, it, it's not possible for us to fathom this. We have every inch of Google Earth is already is visible. A person could see every single iota of the existence if we thought Sambatin was a physical reality. As a physical reality, should be able to see it. If we cannot see it, what, what, what does it mean? I don't know what the answer is. I don't know. It's some kind of reality. It means something. But it's a medish. It's not a pasuk. The medishes can have many meanings. At any rate, Yehuda became the terminology that was used for Jewish people. And already during the time of Golos, the Vuchadnezzar, the Golos Bavel, already the Jewish people, regardless of what tribe they came from, became known, became known as Yehuda. We know this because 70 years later, there's a very famous Jewish leader who happens not to be from the tribe of Yehuda, and the Jewish people are slated for mass genocide. It's documented in a scroll, which is named for Queen Esther. And the name of the man is? Mordechai. Mordechai. What's his last name? Ishimini. No, his Ishimini. name is not Ishimini. His name is Mordechai Hayehudi. He was an Ishimini. That's correct. Why was he Ishimini? Because he was in Binyamin. And Binyamin is Ben Yamin, as Yaakov Avinu called him. Right? And Rachel said Ben Oini. And Yaakov changed the name to Ben Yamin. So he's Ishimini. The name Yamin is right there in the name of Binyamin. And yet, he's called, he's called Hayehudi. His last name is Hayehudi. So the Jewish people have been called... Jews ever since you went into Golis. That's the Golis name for us. Yisrael is our exalted name. That was the name of where we were living in freedom in, in, in great success in Eretz Yisrael. And the name of Yehuda ultimately became the Golis name, not only for the tribe of Yehuda, not only for the kingdom that was comprised of Yehuda and Yemen, but ultimately all Jewish people became known as Yehuda. So any way you want to slice it, we the Jewish people are known as Yehuda. We, we, we lived in a kingdom which is called Eretz Yehuda or Medinas Yehuda, or whatever they called it. So in that case, it should say, Golsa, Golsa Me'oini. Who else could this be? So the Medrash says that we emphasize Yehuda to speak about the fact that the Golos, that the exile of Yehuda was different than the exile of other nations. We are not the first or only nation to be exiled. If you look at ancient history, there are many great nations who at one time filled the world with their splendor, had tremendous economic success, built up mighty civilizations. And today they live in museums. They live in history books. And they were exiled. Other kingdoms came along and exiled them and vanquished them and destroyed their houses of government, their seat of power, and they became dispersed. There are many ancient peoples. I talked about Phoenicians and Akkadians. You meet any Phoenicians lately? Phoenicia was once one of the most powerful countries in the world. Akkadia. Our Hebrew months are Akkadian. But, but, but Acadia, the Acadian civilization no longer is. And nobody even knows where Acadia is. You know where Kurdistan is, but nobody knows where Acadia is. So here's what happens. Uma Sa'ilam Einam Gailam. The Medrash is asking, Uma Sa'ilam Einam Gailam. And La Afa Pisha Gailam, the thing is like this. Even though they do go into exile, Ein Golusam Golos. The exile doesn't have a lingering effect feeling like Golos. They may be ejected from their natural lands, may be ejected from their ancestral geography, but nonetheless, they acclimatize very quickly. And what happens is, Uma Sa'ilam Sha'ichlin Mipitam, that they eat the bread of the host nation that they, that they find themselves in, Veshesa Miyenam, they drink their wine, which is, of course, alludes to two of the prohibitions of we the Jewish people in keeping kashras, even if something is kosher we don't eat pas palter, pas akka, we don't eat the bread that comes from the people around us and we don't drink the yayin, even if it's not nisnasach even if the wine is not poured as a libation even if it's not actually idolatrous nonetheless we do not drink the wine it's kosher, nothing else in it, it's only grapes doesn't matter, it's called yayin stam, we don't drink it so when other nations come, they eat the bread 
they drink the wine, and they eventually acclimatize. They become part of that nation. They simply, they simply shed their old identity, and they assume a new identity of, in the new country that they live. So therefore, Engelus and Golos. It's not a lingering Golos. The people aren't in Golos. At some point, the people are very comfortable. This is who we are. Avil Yisrael, but the Jewish people remain apart and separate at all times. And that is because we do not eat, we do not follow the same diet, we do not engage in these communal get-togethers. And as such, we always remain separate and apart. And because of this, we do not assimilate, which is incidentally the reason for Paspalta and Bishalakon and Yayin Stam, the reason for these prohibitions of the Chachamim is so that we shouldn't assimilate, so that we shouldn't intermarry our Chachamim What's and, the connection between the wine and all that causing this sort of a problem? Because these are prohibitions which are not connected to Kashras per se. So they're spiritual. Well, it's not spiritual, they're very technical. The reason that we have these prohibitions is so that we should not assimilate. If this is to cause a sharp distinction between us and those around us. There must be also like a, maybe a, some sort of a de, de, uh, desensitization that causes this within a person, no? From the physical and to the spiritual, no? I'm it's trying. like you, you are what you eat type thing? Like no, that's exactly the point. The, see, uh, the, there are other faith systems. We're not the only faith system in the world. So if a faith system, whatever it will have, whatever its regulations, if a faith system has a regulation of diet, and there are major faith systems that have yeah. regulatory diets. So if they have a regulatory diet, so they don't eat from that food, but they can still be part of that nation, right? As long as the food is, so to speak, if it fits into that regulatory diet that their religion imposes, so they simply become another nation. The faith system is able to metamorphose from being part of one ancestral country, and they become citizens of another country. It doesn't, it doesn't have, it doesn't hold a connection to the original land that people came from. Like the notion of galut, of exile, in a very literal level, is to de become detached from geography. That's literally what it means. Golsa Yehudi means we got, we, got, we got exiled from the land of Israel. So no other nation has ever come back. You know, like uh, when, you, when you, the United Nations is having deliberations, so one of the things they said is, so what will happen now if ancient countries, ancient nations start coming back and claiming ancestral homelands? Are we gonna start to, to carve up the, the globe again? So what, what did they come, what was the end of their deliberation? There's no other nation like this. <laughs> there, there is no other ancestral nation. There are no Akkadians coming back to, to take Akkadia. There are no Phoenicians coming back to take, to take uh, uh, Lebanon. There, there are no ancient nations. Why are there no ancient nations? There are ancient faith systems. There are people who are following religions, be it for 13 centuries or 2,000 centuries uh, two, uh, or longer, because, because they're, they're not indigenous insofar as the land is concerned. We are the only faith system that remained, a con a connect, kept a connection to not only as an indigenous people, but to an indigenous land. Eretz Yisrael, that's our homeland. And no matter where we went, and no matter what happened to us, we didn't forget Eretz Yisrael, we didn't forget Yerushalayim. And because of this, we were ever exiled. And people would say to us, this is not really your place. And they weren't wrong. They weren't wrong. Where really is the place of a Yid? The place of a Yid is Eretz Yisrael. There's a cute, uh, article I once read, I don't remember who it's from. A fellow was walking to, to services Friday night to Kabbalah Shabbos at the Kotel. And they're walking through the portion, it's called the Arab Quarter. And there was a, an Arab shopkeeper sitting out in front of his store watching these Jews who are dressed in Shabbat clothes going to the Kotel. And, he's, and, and this Jew sees from a distance, he's asking each person, where are you from? And the guy goes, where are you from? I'm from Wisconsin. Ah, I am from Jerusalem. He asked the next guy, where are you from? From Paris. I am from Jerusalem. He asked the next guy, where are you from? I am from. And then this guy comes by. I don't know where he was from. New York or Miami. He said, where are you from? And the guy turns around. He says, Jerusalem. We left 2,000 years ago, but we're back. <laughs> so we're the only ones who remain perpetually in exile. And wherever it is, we say we're still in Gullus. And Gullus means that was, it, we're, we're not in our natural place, and so we're in Gullus. And the question is, how could that be? And, and the Medrash is saying to us, but the reason it says Golsi Yehuda is because Yehuda is the only nation, a Jew is the only person that will always be in exile as long as he's away from Eretz Yisrael. And the Medrash says further. So first of all, we have details, not of, of, of a faith system per se. This is not of what's kosher or not kosher. Let me, 
On the contrary, it's not about kosher or not kosher. It's about, it's about regulations that were made to separate and make us apart. The Medrash says further now, Nations of the world, they, they, they adopt the conventions. So this refers to footwear, it refers to attire, it refers to a wardrobe. That's called the spatki yeshalem. Engelus and golos, they're not identifiable, they don't look different. Ava Yisrael, shehein mahalchen yechefen, the Jewish people who walked barefoot. And of course, this could be some kind of uh, allusion to Tisha B'Av also, where we don't wear leather footwear. But the bottom line is that in as much as we look like everybody else, uh, a frum yid, a yid who keeps himself connected to the Torah mitzvahs is still identifiable. And, and it's not to say that, that the clothing that I wear is so Jewish. I mean, like, uh, I'm an identifiable Jew, but, you know, if I'm wearing an Italian suit, I wear an Italian hat. My hat's called Borstino, it's made in Italy. My suit, uh, I got in Tom's place. I think it's Italian also. My, I'm wearing sneakers now, but they're like, you know, North American sneakers. But, but somehow I'm very identifiable. <laughs> like, like, nobody wonders who, no, you know, like, we just, we, some, we look, we always look, we stick out, we look different. People just know who we are. And, and, and this is, again, not something which is a religious obligation. It doesn't say a yid has to dress this way or that way. You could wear a cap or a hat. Or, it's not the point. the point. The point is somehow that we became identifiable at all times. It's not even a religious thing per se. It's not a religious observance, a ritual thing. And nonetheless, we always, and, and as such, because of that, we always, we remain perpetually in Golos. The Medrash then queries, what does it mean, mi'oyni? What does it mean that we went into Golos out of poverty? And the Medrash says like this, al sha'ach luchametz bepesach, that the problem, the reason we went into Golos is because we abandoned Hashem. And he says, we ate chametz on Pesach. As it says, le'seich lo'alav chametz, the Pasuk says, you shall not eat chametz shivas yamim, the seven days. Teich lo'alav matzah, you have to eat matzah. And the Torah specifically calls it lechem oyni. So Golsa Yehuda, the Medr says, what was the cause of our galos? Me'ayni, because we were eating chametz, because we weren't eating matzah. Of course, we could connect this to the idea that matzah is michla de mehemenusa. The matzah is the bread of faith. The faith that a yid has, that in the end, the survival is not by the largest or favor of the nations around us, or what anybody does for us, but rather we survive by virtue of the chesed of our Kaddish Baruch Hu, and that we, have, we survive by our faith. There's a famous Rishima manuscript from the Rebbe where he talks about the fact that it says that when Og came to Avram Avinu to tell him about Lot, it says that Avram Avinu was eating matzah. And because of matzah is a uga, that's why the Medrash says he's called Og. Og is connected to uga. So the uh, obvious question is, okay, so he happened to be eating uh, matzah. But what if he was eating uh, something else? What if he was having uh, roast beef? So then Og's name would be roast beef? Like, <laughs> what, what does that have to do with anything? I, I, it's like making a tiny detail into the narrative, into the focal point of the story. <coughs> the Rebbe explained that <coughs> Og was certain that Avram Avinu would follow his <coughs> advice. Why? Because he said if he's eating <coughs> matzah, Og understood that matzah is bread of faith, even though there was no Golos Mitzrayim yet and no Gulim in Mitzrayim. But matzah is Michal de Memnusa. And Og somehow had this perception that Avram, in doing so, was expressing faith. And he said if he's eating matzah, which is faith, then I'll have faith, but I've, uh, Og laughed. He said, this faith is ridiculous. He's not gonna, now, how's he gonna survive on faith? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a mighty <coughs> army, he's gonna be destroyed. But in the end, matzah represents faith. So when we began faith, faithlessness to Hashem, and when we ate chametz on Pesach, that caused that we should end up being in a situation of Oini. The Medrash Shabbat goes through a whole slew of examples of Oini, of oppressing poor people, of not giving tzedakah properly, of not giving loans, or of, taking, of being loan sharks and taking money, and says all that boils down to Oini, and this is the concept of Golsi Yehuda Oini. And the Medrash finishes with the following idea. When the Jewish people made the golden calf, so Moshe Rabbeinu came down from the mountain. And who was waiting for him when he came down from the mountain? Yehoshua was waiting. And Yehoshua had no clue of what was going on in the camp, because they, everybody was away in the camp, and he was at the foot of the mountain where he didn't move, like, Leizaz, he didn't mush, Leizaz, he didn't mush, he didn't move, he stayed right there. From the last moment he saw Meshach Rabbeinu, he waited for Meshach Rabbeinu's return. And, uh, and, and Yeshua says to Meshach Rabbeinu, there's a, there's a sound, the sound of, of revelry, it's the sound of, of victors, or the sound of being vanquished, there's an attack, there's a battle. And Meshach Rabbeinu says, no, this is not the sound of the weak being vanquished, it's not the sound of victors, 
were exulting over their success. This is koil anois anoichi shomea, which Rashi explains is the idea of blasphemy. Moshe said this is a revelry that is blasphemous. So the, the Medr says, Amar Rabbi Acha, Rabbi Acha says that what does it mean of gold to Yisrael me'oyni? That this idea of koil anois means koil kilos arvedas kechavim. It was a it was a sound of praise of idolatry. That's what he heard. And therefore, Rabbi Yeshia, Rabbi Yehuda, B'Shem Rabbi Yeshia, Eimer, on this very idea of Gol, so Yehuda, Me'oini, that the Jewish people went into Gol, Me'oini, Rabbi Acha seems to say this alludes back to the concept of the golden calf. He says, Ein l'cha dur v'dur, she'eini noitol mechete shalegel. There isn't a generation of the Jewish people that experiences some kind of punishment for whatever they may have done that has in it a little bit of a lingering effect of the eagle. In other words, the eagle was such a damning and such a terrible catastrophic effect for us spiritually that there's, there's a residual effect. And whenever we go into Golos, there's a little bit of eagle mixed into that. And that's the Pshat, says the Medish, of Golsa, Yehuda Me'oini. Me'oini means going back to Koila Nois that is related to the original catalyst, which is the concept of the, of the golden calf. Yashva Bagoyim, Vilimatsam Anoyach. She sat amongst the, gen- the, the nations and could not find peace. Rabbi Yudan ben Rabbi Nechemia says in the name of Rish Lakish, of Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish, Ilu matzam anoyach chezeres. Had the Jewish people found respite, who knows where we would be today? Sometimes people say that anti-Semitism is the, is the cause of our survival. It's a very frightening thing to contemplate. But if the nations had actually fully welcomed us and we had found peace and we had acclimatized ourselves, who knows if we would still be today? It's a tragic truth. So this is this is this is the meaning of Golsa Yehuda Mi'aini Leimatzam Anayach. The Yudan says the fact is that unlike in he says there's an example of this, a historic example of this, and the historic example is the first time we find Leimatzam Anayach, and that was in the story of the Yoyne, of the of the of the dove, the dove, which people think is a, a bird that represents like like peace. Or, or, uh, or, or people mistakenly think that peace comes out of, out of compromise and out of weakness. But actually, the dove was a very hardy bird, and he was very feisty. He didn't want Noah's favors. He came back with an olive branch. And olives are bitter. An olive, is, an olive tree is a very hardy tree. Olive trees are the only trees that survive the marble, at least in Eretz Yisrael. And, 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 and the message of the dove was, I'd rather eat bitter olives than sweet food from your hand. So it was a very defiant, a very defiant bird. And it says, then the, the Yoyna, the dove didn't find anywhere to rest. There wasn't even a single exposed branch. So he came back. But then the second time, the dove did find where to rest. And the moment the dove did find where to rest, the dove didn't come back anymore. My friends, the Jewish people sometimes are metaphorized as a dove. Yonasi Sarmasi. And the Kotel famously has doves that nest itself, always have always nested itself in the Kotel representing the Jewish people who never left behind the Shekhinah, who always came home. We've always come home. And the reason we always come home is as it says, <laughs> like it says in the end of Chumash Dvarim, where everything is foretold about the future by Meish Rabbeinu, it says we will not find respite, we will not find peace. <laughs> and because we will not find peace, this is the reason that ultimately we will always remain separate and apart. And in the end, we will always come home. I want to conclude with uh, the words that the Rebbe penned in the three weeks in 1959. <clears throat> and in a letter to somebody, he, he just wrote a few cryptic sentences interpreting this verse on, from on a mystical level, on a spiritual level. And the Rebbe said, it should be fulfilled because we know that every verse of Yirmiyo that has negative connotation also is filled with positivity. And it's also filled with a message of light. It's Torah, and Torah is eternal. And Megillah Seichel will still be, but Megillah Seichel will be when Mashiach will come, when Tisha B'Av is a great Yom Tov, Megillah Seichel will be a book that's filled with amazing messages and beautiful ideas. So what's the beautiful idea of Golsa Yehuda Mi'ayni? So the Rebbe said it should be fulfilled that Golsa, the word Golsa, which is, means in a literal, in its literal iteration, it means exile, but it also is L'Shen Gilui, it also is a permutation of the word revelation. So Golsa Yehuda, Golsa means to uncover. Uncover her would be Ligalot Ota, or Golsa means she was uncovered. 
In other words, Yehuda will be revealed. Lashing Gilui. Gilui could be in a negative connotation. Somebody was stripped, God forbid. But it could also be in a very positive connotation. Where Yehuda becomes revealed. What's Yehuda? Yehuda representing the Jewish people. That's the Golos name they gave for us. But Yehuda also represented Mordechai HaYehudi because Mordechai HaYehudi was the person who was He refused to bow his head. He refused to acknowledge the power of the idol. In other words, Yehuda is the Inyan of Hoidoya. Yehuda is the idea of acknowledgement. As we learned in Lukut HaTere yesterday, in the beginning of al Rebbe's Memorim, for, for, Chum, for Chumash Dvarim, which starts off with, with the, an elaboration and explanation of the, the Pasuk of the Haftere, that speaks about, that speaks about the, the redemption that will come about. So the Alter Rebbe speaks over there about the notion of Hidoya. What does it mean, Hidoya, to acknowledge God? And he says, this acknowledgement, which is the idea of Moida'ani, this is the Alakaina Shomash of Sata Bita Hedihi, that it ends of Ata Barasa, Ata Yitzarta, Ata Nafakta, Ata Mishamra. And he says, this, this whole prayer is about the idea of Hidoya, where a Yid is, is, is Moida, Moida'ani Lefonecha, Shem Alekai. So the idea of Hidoya represents the deepest essence of a Yid's awareness of a Kaddish Baruch Hu's presence. Even that's not understood. Even it can't be explained. And that's why after Lekai Neshama and after Hidoya has become brachas. Bracha means bracha vav shacha, to actualize, to bring things into a concrete way. A person could have emuna, but it doesn't affect him in a, in a, in a, fully. It doesn't really make him behave more, in a moral way. Like the Gemara says, we have a, ga, a ganaf, and he's making his heist. He's breaking in to steal somebody else's money, which is definitely wrong. And what's he doing as he's, as he's making his, his break in? He's Rachman Akarya. He's calling out for God to help him. So clearly he believes that God could help him. If he doesn't believe God could help him, why would he call to God to help him? Say, hey, if you believe God could help you, don't you think God could give you Parnasa without stealing? So if you're already praying and you want God to help you, just pray, Hashem should give you Parnasa. <clears throat> Instead, you're violating the Torah, you're stealing, but you're praying. So a Muna could sometimes be in a, in a superficial, atmospheric way, and that's not good. So therefore, we have this notion of Hidoya. Hidoya represents a very deep and profound <coughs> awareness that a Yid has of Hashem. Unfortunately, it doesn't always affect our day-to-day -day life. But when Mashiach will come, then the Hidoya will rise and shine in an amazing way, in a very profound way. So this is the idea of Golsa Yehuda. The positive message of this Pasuk is Yehuda, the Hidoya, the deepest essence in the Yid's awareness of Hashem's presence will become revealed. And that's Me'oyni. What does Me'oyni mean? Me'oyni means of affliction. Like matzah, bread of affliction. But the Rebbe says this means Me'oytzim is kafia. We know that in serving Hashem there are two approaches. One is to crush and subdue the negative forces, starting with our own Yetzirah, with our own Klippa, with the dark, dark side that every one of us has. The dark side that says, eat what you shouldn't eat, go where you shouldn't go, look what you shouldn't look at, and so on and so forth. Say what you shouldn't say. All the things that a person could do. Unfortunately, we have a whole bunch of Avedas, 365 arenas of things that we could do. And many of them, the Yetzirah is actively engaged and involved in trying to get us to violate. So how does a Yid overcome that? The answer is, he crushes that. He restrains himself. He crushes that desire. He refuses to give, refuses to give in to it. That's called the skafia. That's called when you break yourself. Of course, there's a higher level. And that's his habcha, when you're able to transform things, you're able to use the mundane and the ordinary in a positive way, able to channel and harness it for Avedis Hashem. But oini, or deprivation, or the idea of, 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 of pain, this comes when a, when a yid is engaged in iskafia. What enables us to reveal a What enables us the deepest, most profound essence of a yid to be revealed? The answer is me'oini. It's out of those challenges. So instead of simply saying that we exist because of anti-Semitism or because people refuse to accept us, that's why we're forced to build and identify ourselves, di defining ourselves ultimately dialectically, which is ridiculous. We shouldn't define ourselves by anti-Semites. We have to define ourselves by who we are. But, but there is an element of when there's oini, when there's persecution, when a yid is under the most difficult circumstances, this brings forth the most profound level of commitment and love to Hashem. Like it says in Hasidus about the idea of the Jewish people being metaphorized as olives. And when you crush the olive, that's when the oil, that's when the source of light and the energy comes forth. And why is this? Because she sat amongst the nations. And therefore, there was great challenges. Much greater challenges than we ever experienced before. Golas comes in many flavors. Golas comes in many, many colors, in many shapes and sizes. But the Hatzad HaShavah the common denominator of all the Goliaths, when they hated us, 
or when they loved us, is always that it provided enormous challenges for us, always. And therefore, Le Matzah means we did not find the concept, concept of, of peace. We didn't make peace with the situation, but instead, instead of sitting back, relaxing, and enjoying, we worked hard at overcoming these circumstances. This is the secret of our success. And therefore, we say, as a result of these efforts, as a result of this commitment, as a result of this devotion, in the end, all those who pursue her will reach her. Who is the pursuing? Who pursues the Yid? So David Amel says in the, in the 23rd Psalm, Ach, toi v'chesed yidifuni. Instead of my enemies pursuing me, what should pursue me? Toi v'chesed, goodness and kindness. V'sigua ben ha-mitzarim, it reaches in between the narrow straits. The Medrash says that this can mean a variety of things, including the narrow straits, the dates of Shavasa Batamos and Tisha B'av. But here the Rebbe says, this represents the idea that a Yid in the state of Golas calls out to Hashem with great yearning. And that we say is, min ha-meitzar karasika. From the depths we cry out to Hashem. So when the Yid cries out from the depths, feeling that distance from Hashem, and he cries out from those depths, so that's what brings about all of this wonderful revelation. Hashem should help us, that min ha-meitzar, that from the squeeze of Golos, and from the oini, from the challenges of Yashva ben Agoyim le-matzom anoyach, that we should merit him, it's Hashem, to Golsa Yehuda, to the revelation of the deepest essence of the neshama, of the yechidish of the neshama. We know that Mashiach represents that on a cosmic level, and we should merit to see that cosmically, personally, and, 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 and redemption on every level to return to Eretz Yisrael Lashlema, to be in the third base of Migdash Hashem, with Mashiach, with Heira, who will be a main or a main. Amen. Amen.